Hi everyone, welcome to Mission San Luis. I'm Rebecca, your time traveling educator for the day. And it's about time that we go on another homeschool day time traveling adventure. Now we're gonna talk about a very special subject today. Here at Mission San Luis, we talk about the Appalachian native peoples who lived in this region and lived at Mission San Luis. But did you know that there are many other native communities who lived in Florida and the surrounding lands in the 1600s? We're gonna talk about a couple of these different groups today. In the 1600s, native communities in Florida, Georgia, and Alabama lived in a wide range of environments, including sandy and marshy coasts, in pinelands, and in wide open grasslands. And they ate an incredible variety of food, including many different types of land and sea animals and hundreds of different types of plants. Not only did these native communities live in many different environments, but they also had many different cultural customs and spiritual traditions. And what's really amazing is that the descendants of the native peoples who lived in Florida in the 1600s still exist today in many different communities. So we just learned that there are a bunch of native communities that once lived in Florida in the 1600s, but today, we're going to talk about those that were closest to the Appalachian, their immediate neighbors. Some of the Appalachian's closest neighbors were the Chicado, the Apalachicola, the Tamuqua, and the Guale. And they all lived around North Florida and the surrounding region. Now, while this modern hillside definitely looks different than it did in the 1600s, we can get an idea of what it might have been like for the Appalachian peoples to have to go a long distance, miles and miles, to meet their closest neighbors. All of these native communities lived in and around Florida. They all had similarities, such as growing corn, and differences such as the types of pottery they made. All of these neighbors of the Appalachian interacted with them in many different ways. Sometimes they traded with each other, sometimes they had conflicts between one another, but they all made the surrounding region their home. So I think it's time that we learn a little bit more about these different native communities who lived around Mission San Luis and how they interacted with their Appalachian neighbors. I know the best way to do that. Let's go through the time portal and travel back in time to Mission San Luis. Come on, let's go. Oh good, it looks like we're just in time. The Appalachian are having a festival in their council house today and they've invited representatives from the four native communities around them, their neighbors that we just talked about. So we're gonna go in and we're gonna meet my friend Mateo, who's a villager here at Mission San Luis, and he's gonna help introduce us to these four different groups. Are you ready? All right, let's go join the festival. Rebecca, I'm so excited you've made it out to the festival today. Yes, we're so excited to be here. In fact, I brought some friends who want to participate in the festival and want to learn more. Cool. Have you ever been to an Appalachian festival before? Oh, I have, but I'm not sure that my friends have. Oh, well, let me show you around some of the things you might see for the festival today. Wonderful. While the native communities that are here today have their own ways of doing festivals, there is a lot of similarities between them and the Appalachian. So for instance, and we're all going to use these like gourd shakers to make some music as well as other bells and clackers and uh, noise makers and that's going to be accompanied by different types of dances. Now all the different communities have their own types of dances but here at Appalachian Territory we have Appalachian dances. Another thing you'll find at lots of these festivals is of course the black drink also known as casino. 
Now that's a tea made from the leaves of this Yopan holly plant. Now the Appalachian and the other native communities like to brew and drink casina because it gives them a lot of energy for their celebrations. And of course, another thing you'll see around here are different types of body adornment, such as wearing these feathers. Now, feathers could be from turkeys, like this one, ospreys, uh, blue jays, and they all have their different significance and symbolisms, but they also are, of course, very beautiful and add to a lot to the festival. You all made it here just in time because the representatives from the four major communities have set up on the benches inside the council house. Mm. It looks like uh, the Chicago have set up over there, we got the Tamakwa, uh, even the Apalachicoa, and the Gwale. Oh, that's great, but they came just for the festival? Well, yes and no. Of course they came here for the festival, but they also came here to have a big council. That's why we're here in the council house, having everyone set up so they can talk about what's going on in their different communities. So as you can see, the representatives have set up here on these inner benches in the council house. And it looks like they have different items that represent their communities. So why don't we start over with this one right here. So who do you think brought the thing that I'm sitting on right now? Well, first, what am I sitting on right now? That's right, a bison fur. Now, because I'm sitting on a bison fur, this is probably the setup for the Chicado. The Chicado lived to the west of the Appalachie, and their area has a lot of bison in it, whereas the Appalachie territory here doesn't really have that many bison in it. And while the Chicado live traditionally to the west of Appalachie territory, they've actually been coming more and more east into Appalachie province because they're at war with a tribe called the Chiska. Now, the Chiska War is not going too great for the Chicado, so they've actually been moving to the safety of Appalachian territory and setting up in this area. So because there are so many bison in Chicado lands, they become widely known for being familiar and skillful with hunting them, even to the point that if the Appalachian or the Spanish want to go and hunt bison, you usually go and contact the Chicado to send some guides to help us out with the hunt. Wow, bison are big, strong animals, and you need a lot of experience and skill to be able to hunt them. That's why it was so important that the Appalachian and the Spanish asked the Chicado to help them hunting. If you live in a land for a long time, like the Chicado lived in their land, you're probably going to learn a lot about the animals that live there and how to use the animal resources, particularly how to hunt them. So that's how the Chicado learned to be such expert bison hunters. So if an Appalachian representative and a Chicago representative were sitting across from each other on a bench and talking, do you think that they would be able to understand each other? Well, maybe, but actually maybe not. Now, we don't know much about the Chicago language, but what we do know is that the Appalachian often had trouble understanding the Chicago without help. That must mean that the Chicago language was somewhat different from the Appalachian language. So, that's one thing we know about Florida native peoples. Their languages were sometimes different. Sometimes they were just slightly different, kind of like American English and British English. Sometimes they had a lot more difference, like the difference in German and Dutch in Europe. Has there ever been a time where you needed help understanding your neighbor's language? How many languages do you speak? Well, Florida native peoples might have spoken several languages to be able to understand the people around them. And they might have actually helped others by translating different languages. So the Chicado and the Appalachian were actually in conflict with each other for many, many years. Now, all of that kind of changed in 1639 when the governor of Florida, Castro y Pardo, sat them down and encouraged them to have peace talks. Now, ever since those peace talks, some of the Chicago and the Appalachian have been allies and have helped each other out on numerous occasions. So by the time that the Appalachian and the Chicago had made peace, the Appalachian province had been well known for having lots of missions set up by the Spanish. So you'll never guess what the Chicago asked for when they had made peace with them. That's right, missions of their own. So some of the Chicago reached out to the Spanish and they had sent friars over to set up missions of their own in some of their territories. 
So while the Chikatua homeland is to the west of Appalachian territory, more and more of them have been coming eastern because of a war that's been going on between them and a group called the Chiska. Now, as those Chikatoans come towards Appalachian territory, the Appalachians have actually helped them out by negotiating with them. So one of the major negotiations between the Appalachian and the Chikato was the establishment of the village of San Carlos. Now, that negotiation made it so that the Chikato would get a little bit of land from the Appalachian and they could in turn grow their own crops and set up their own houses there. However, they didn't get it for free. They instead had to give some other resources like some of the excess food that they grew or maybe even bear skins or deer skins that they hunted on the territory back to the Appalachian. And they also had to provide the Appalachian with warriors when it came to different conflicts with native communities. So this example shows how the Appalachian and the Chicato can work together in order for both of them to benefit from a situation which was not too great to start with. So who do you think could have brought all of these different types of tools? Well, if we look at them, you can see that we have lots of different shell tools for like gardening and woodworking. So this probably is the setup for the Tamukwa. So because the Tamukwa have a large area of North Florida that is their territory, the Tamukwa are actually not all the same and they have their own regional differences. There are lots of different types of Tamukwa villages and the biggest divide is actually between those Tamukwa who live in the west and those who live in the east. Now, the Tamukwa live to the east of the Appalachian, in the part of North Florida between the Appalachian and the east coast. Now, because of them being so close to the coast, they developed these really cool shell tools early on, and they're really effective at what they do. Now, the Appalachian probably traded with the Tamukwans to get these really cool shell tools, but all of that kind of changed when the Spanish arrived, because then they started trading for iron tools. Like this hoe. So the Tamukwa, like the Appalachian and other southeastern tribes, played their own version of the ball game. Now the type of ball game that they played really depended on where they were. So the western Tamukwans played the ball game just like the Appalachian did, using Appalachian rules. Now the eastern Tamukwans would play their own version with slightly different rules and slightly different ways of playing. Now, no matter where they were playing it, the ball game was still just as important and just as popular among all of the different tribes. One of the Appalachian spiritual traditions for the ball game was when they would paint their bodies. Now, the Tzmukwa paint their bodies as well, but they usually paint them for other occasions too. And I even hear that the Tzmukwa would give themselves tattoos, getting more and more of them as they get older, and they all have their own spiritual and symbolic meaning. Now, one of the most common types of materials that both the Tamukwa and the Appalachian used when painting their bodies or other things like deer skins, for example, was ochre. Now, ochre is a type of clay that has different minerals in it that give it its color. Now, the most common types of colors that ochre can be are red and yellow. Now, a very interesting thing about ochre is that you don't find a lot of it in Florida. You have to go to Alabama to be able to find a lot of ochre. And the Tamukwa had big trade networks in which they were able to get these types of colors or pigments from Alabama or Georgia by trading different items with the native communities there. And then the Tamukwa traded these colors with the Appalachian. Now one major difference between the Appalachian and the Tamukwa is that they speak different languages. And the languages are different enough that the Appalachian and the Spanish in particular need translators in order to understand their Tamukwa allies and neighbors. 
Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't shared words between the two languages, such as the word holahata, which is the Appalachian Tamako word for a high-ranking chief. Speaking of the word holahata, the Appalachian and the Tamakwa both have their own chiefs, with some being considered higher up than other chiefs. Now, one big difference between the Appalachian and the Tamakwa chiefs is that the Tamakwa actually allow women to become chiefs. Now, one woman chief that I've heard stories about was named Doña Maria Melendez. Now, Maria was the chief of an Eastern Tamakwa group, and she interacted a lot with the Spanish over at San Augustine. She gave them aid and helped them out in various ways, and even married a Spanish soldier at one point. Now, because of her work, she was able to create a peaceful and friendly relationship between the Tamakwa and the Spanish. When the Spanish founded the city of St. Augustine in 1565 on the east coast of Florida, they began interacting a lot more with the Tamakwa. Now, part of these interactions were setting up different missions, and these actually were the first missions in the whole mission system that we now know in the North Florida area. And these missions would eventually expand into other territories like Appalachian Territory. As the Spanish started interacting more and more with the Tamakwa, they helped them plan meetings between themselves and their other native communities surrounding them, such as the Appalachian. Now, the Appalachian and especially the Western Tamakwa were not always on the best of terms and would often fight and have other conflicts with each other. Now, in 1608, a friar by the name of Fray Martin Perito set up a meeting between the Appalachian and the Western Tamakwa groups, and they kind of helped them to put together a, a peace plan that the different organizations and different groups then independently acted on. Ah. So here we have another group set up on this bench. And you know, I can tell by just looking at the pottery what group this is. Now I want you to take a look at these two pots. Which one do you think was made by the Appalachian and which one do you think was made by another group? Now, if you said this one was made by another group, you were right. Now, the different native communities that are here today, as well as other native communities, have different ways of making pottery. Now, they have different shapes, different sizes, different materials, and of course, different designs on them. Now, I can tell by looking at this pot that it is probably made by the Appalachian Cola because of these little tiny black dots on it. So if you just look at the pot, you can then see the difference. Now, while the pots may look different on the outside, one of the biggest differences between the Appalachian and the Appalachian Cola pottery are the materials that they use to actually make the pot. So what's on the inside of the walls? Now, the biggest difference is that they use different tempers when they make their pottery. Now what's temper? Well, temper is the hard broken pieces of pottery or shell fragments that you mix into wet clay before you build your pot. Now why would you want to mix, you know, pieces of shell and broken pieces of pottery into your wet clay before making the pot? Well, that's so that the pot doesn't break when it's fired. You see, the temper actually absorbs some of the heat of the fire and makes sure that the clay doesn't get so hot that it cracks and breaks when it's fired. So temper is actually very important. So when the Appalachian make pottery, they like to use grog as their temper. That's basically crushed up pieces of old pottery that they've been mixed with new clay and they're able to make a brand new pot out of it. But the Apalachicola prefer to use shell fragments instead. So the Apalachicola lived by many different rivers. And this is probably one reason that they used more shell in their pots than the Apalachee. They could find them in the rivers. And because the Apalachicola use shell in their pottery, you can actually see it on the walls of the pot. So the little black holes or little black dots that you see on the pot, 
Those were from the shell cooking in the fire. So now that we've talked about the different pottery that the Apalachicola brought, let's learn more about them. So the Apalachicola live out to the west of Apalachee province. They live actually along the Apalachicola River. So the Apalachee and the Apalachicola are very big trade partners. So they trade different items such as these deer skin for other things such as these copper bells, which are actually made by Europeans. And then they would trade these the copper bells for other items such as iron tools, which were also brought over by the Spanish. Now, if an Apalachicola had amassed enough iron tools or other trade goods, they could go back to the Apalachee and trade for even horses. Now, while the Apalachee trade their goods with other native communities and the Spanish, the Apalachicola actually trade their goods more often with the French and the English. So just like the Chicato and the Tamaqua, the Apalachicola often fought and had many conflicts with the Apalachee here in Apalachee province. Now, also similar to the Chicato and the Tamaqua, the Spanish came in and helped the Apalachicola and the Apalachee to make peace with each other. However, of all the communities gathered here today in the council house, I would say that the Apalachicola have probably the rockiest relationship with the Apalachee still. So Rebecca, have you ever been out to St. Augustine before? Oh, yes I have. It's beautiful out there. Excellent. You might recognize some of the things on this bench. I thought I recognized what this was. Now, I know what it is, but do you guys? What does it look like? And what are these right here? That's right. These are shark's teeth. So if we have shark's teeth and shells and shell tools, what type of environment or landscape do you think the people who have these items live? That's right. They live along the coast. So these are probably the items brought over by the Guale. So the Guale live to the north of St. Augustine along the coast. Now some of their kind of groups go a little bit further inland, but for the most part, their communities are along the coast. And like the Tamakua, the Guale like to use shells and other things and materials from along the coast in their daily lives. So they could use shell tools, shell ornamentation, make shell gorgets, things like that. So shells and other things from along the coast are very important to their community. It takes a lot of skill to shape shell into the sh designs and shapes that you want it to look like. So the Guale and the Tamukwa are very skilled in their abilities to kind of carve out, cut different parts of shells, and turn shells into different items. So while the Spanish set up their first missions in La Florida with the Tamukwa, the Guale were actually the second community that the Spanish set up missions with. So the Guale and the Tamakwa together started kind of the, the trend of missions in the region. Now one game that the Guale love to play is called Chunky. Now Chunky requires a little chunky stone like this, so it's kind of like a little puck. And the whole point of the game is that you have one thrower or roller who will roll the chunky stone out into a field. And once the chunky stone is rolling, you'll have other players with either bows and arrows or even spears and they will throw the spears or shoot the bows and arrows to as close to where they think the chunky stone will stop. Now where the chunky stone stops, whosoever arrow or spear is closest wins. So to get a game started you just get the chunky stone and roll it out. Actually I think I hear some people coming back to the village. I'm gonna go see if they wanna play some chunky. So enjoy the festival. All right, bye, see you later. Wow, well, I guess it's time for us to head out too. But it was so nice to see you today. And it was so nice to learn about all of the different Native American communities that once lived around Mission San Luis and who still live in Florida and the Southeast. We can't wait to see you on our next time traveling adventure. So we'll see you soon.